AHLA is pleased to present this special series highlighting the top 10 health law issues of 2022, where we bring together thought leaders from across the health law field to discuss the major trends and developments of the year. Support for AHLA in this series is provided by PYA, which helps clients find value in the complex challenges related to mergers and acquisitions, clinical integrations, regulatory compliance, business valuations and fair market value assessments, and tax and assurance. For more information, visit PYAPC.com. Well, hello, gentle listener, and welcome to episode nine. Um, I am Marty Ross, a consultant with PYA. I am joined today by Tiana Corley, who is with the University of Michigan Office of General Counsel. Um, Tiana's had an impressive career in health law, both within the government, uh, working for AMCs, as well as in private practice. And she was the author of Toward a Common De Definition of Value-Based Arrangements um, in the top 10 article. So welcome, Tiana. Thank you so much, Marty. I'm happy to be here. And thank you to you for taking time and HLA for this opportunity. Well, in your article, um, you address sort of the aftermath of the December 2020 publication of the new anti-kickbacks, safe harbor, and Stark Law exception relating to value-based arrangements um, and how uh, hospitals and physicians and other providers are grappling with those rules as they look forward in pursuing value-based arrangements. But let's just start with a kind of a broad question. Um, you know, in, this, in a world of fee-for-service reimbursement, the fraud and abuse laws make sense because you're trying to prevent overutilization uh, based, um, incentivized for something other than the best interest of the patient. But when you're in a value-based model, do these rules even make sense? Yeah, that's a great question, Marty. And I think that, um, you know, we're kind of in this hybrid world, right? So we have, um, you know, some fee-for-service remaining, uh, quite a significant amount of fee-for-service remaining. And even some of the alternative payment models, whether it be the Medicare Shared Savings Program, which is, you know, of course, the permanent program, as well as some of the uh, models that we see coming out of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovations uh, uh, at CMS, those are built essentially on a fee-for-service chassis. And so there's still some of those fee-for-service uh, elements that are remaining. And so I think this is the government's best attempt to really kind of recognize the reality that payers and others are trying to get providers to move in the direction of value-based care, but we're still in this a bit of a hybrid world where some of those incentives that OIG expressed concern about around overutilization, um, improper motives around quality of care, as well as uh, re a reduction in beneficiary freedom of choice, um, those, some of those legacy um, elements are still remaining in our current system. So it's kind of a balancing effort, I think, on the part of both CMS and OIG. I, I like that imagery of sort of a hybrid state. And but this hybrid state has been going on for a while. I mean, we sort of mark the the Affordable Care Act is the beginning of a formal transition to value-based care. What have providers been doing prior to the publication of the exception in the safe harbor? How have they been navigating these issues as they move towards value-based arrangements? Yeah, I think it's kind of the answer is as best as, as we all could. Um, I think that um, historically, uh, the, the incentives, particularly on the physician side, have been essentially volume driven. And I'm not sure that we've moved away from that. Um, in fact, there was a really good uh, article uh, published by the RAND Corporation recently on just that, um, just that issue in, in, in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And so I think that physicians still are seeing a lot of um, incentives based on volume, but really we see some change and probably the faster um, uh, change on the, on the payer and hospital side, um, definitely. So we see payers seeking to incent hospitals to deliver care in a different way, focused on quality and focused on the total cost of care. But it's a little unclear that, that those uh, metrics have um, transitioned down to to physicians. And so, um, so it's, it, it'll be interesting to see over the next few years, 
um, whether uh, we do see restructuring, particularly on the physician incentive compensation side as health systems move to different models of care. Yeah, you made reference to the good old Medicare Shared Savings Program, um, which had built into the model um, some leeway uh, for financial arrangements among the participants. Um, can you comment on the success of that in, in promoting the MSSP objectives? So it's an interesting question. So um, as, as you know, um, Medicare Shared Savings Program uh, comes with waivers of the fraud and abuse laws that are even broader than anything that's been um, included essentially in the in the final rule from OIG or CMS. And I know that um, those waivers, though, essentially are going to be time limited because providers can't spend the whole, they, they, they have a defined amount of time in the Medicare Shared Savings Program. And so even for providers that are essentially relying on those waivers that are available through MSSP, those waivers aren't going to last forever. And um, some of the waivers that we see coming out of the Innovation Center attached to other models aren't as broad as what we see in the permanent Medicare Shared Savings Program. So really providers needed these rules from OIG and CMS to begin to realize what life would be like, either if they're not participating in the Medicare Shared Savings Program or essentially for life after the Medicare Shared Savings Program. So um, I, I, I think I would encourage those who advise providers um, who are participating in the Medicare Shared Savings Program to think about what that life looks like after transition from that program because um, you know, that you do have to come up with like a reality after um, that participation ends. Um, if you're not going to go, you know, through to the enhanced model, if you're going to come out at some time, just really thinking about what that looks like. Well, that, that's an interesting point. We, it, this this roughy, rough transition from basic to enhanced and the increasing degree of risk that the program pushes you into, certainly CMS was, didn't hide anything saying that was clearly their intent. Is that part of the intent behind these exceptions and, and safe harbor as well? Is that is this again CMS and OIG trying to gently push more and more towards risk? You know, I think so. I mean, I, I see it that way, right? By virtue of there being less flexibility on the care coordination side, as well as a host of different program integrity safeguards and guardrails that we have to comply with um, for purposes of um, in the safe harbor for care coordination, um, and then far, far fewer uh, program integrity uh, components associated if you're taking on full financial risk. And so um, as the government has been clear about its desire to move providers into risk, I think that these safe harbors and exceptions recognize that reality and shared goal. Um, I also think, though, that this is the government's attempt to balance um, providers who may not be ready to take on full risk and that they may never be able to take on full risk. And so you see a lot in the preamble commentary about small practices and rural providers. And you even see some concern by those who commented on the proposed rules about whether or not these um, final rules favor larger providers um, and will reduce competition. And so it's really, I think, a tough job for both OIG and CMS to try to come out with rules that A, address the whole healthcare industry um, that, that um, where these rules apply, and also even within um, certain stakeholder groups, for example, you know, physician practices, coming up with rules that apply to a physician practice with several hundred physicians versus a solo practitioner. Um, that's affiliating with another provider. So it's it's a really hard work. And I, I honestly think that the OIG and CMS did, did a good job. Um, they're likely are, are improvements that I would make. Um, but, but, but I think that this was the first shot at really historic reform to um, the implementing regulations for both the Stark Law as well as the Safe Harbors for the Anti-Kickback Statute. You don't think they're done, do you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I do not. Some more refinements. Okay. I do not. Well, let's let's delve into the exceptions and I uh, and exceptions slash waiver. And I, I really liked your approach of looking at this um, by way of definition. 
of, C of CMS and OIG trying to get their arms around what is this stuff. And I, I have to admit, I kind of had to create a cheat sheet here um, to sort of see if I can capture all these terms. So the exception and the waiver are focused on, exception and safe harbor, excuse me, are focused on um, a value-based arrangement, which is one in which the parties are engaged in defined value-based activities for a specific value-based purpose um, tied to an identified target patient population. Did I miss any of the key terms there? I think you got them all. Well, let's talk about those. And so what is a value-based purpose as they define it? Well, so I think that the government did give us, or they did articulate in the regulation specific kind of a menu of value-based purposes um, for providers. And so I think that this is one of those definitions where, you know, if we're looking at coordinating and managing care for a target patient population or transitioning from fee-for-service to, um, to a more value-based care uh, type of um, way of care delivery, this was the government's attempt at structuring a definition where providers could have some insight as to what that term really means. Left to the devices of the provider community and without any guidance, I think, you know, there are any number of things that we would choose um, to be defined as value-based purposes. So the government did give us, I think it's an option of four um, um, choices, essentially, of, of what constitutes a value-based purpose. Well, let's talk about everyone's favorite stark topic, gain sharing arrangements, um, because for a hospital, those are typically driven by reduction of operating costs um, and having partnerships with physicians to you know, more standardized processes with the intent of reducing costs. But one can also argue um, that gain sharing arrangements are about the importance of standardization of practice and that in fact reinforces better quality care, greater efficiency. How does one you know, navigate that value-based purchase when there are often these dual interests in pursuing some of these arrangements? Yeah, so I think gain sharing, I mean, the, the government has given us a lot of latitude on gain sharing anyway, because the, the, the law was revised by Congress. And that was at a time that um, my former boss, Congressman McDermott, um, worked on um, making that adjustment um, to the law. Um, so I, I think that you're, you're right, that it's, it's hard to synthesize the incentives of physicians and of health systems. And that's an increasing theme that, um, you know, that we see. Um, even, even for employed physicians, I think it's sometimes hard to align incentives. And in terms of the improvements that we might see down the line, I think that there's an opportunity for OIG and CMS to recognize that and, and make some changes in that space. Okay. Um, what's a target patient population? Do you have to have them by name or can you generally just describe their characteristics? You can. I think providers got a lot of latitude in the final rule with what constitutes a target patient population. And so I think my one of my favorite lines from the commentary is that, you know, an entire patient population can be a target patient population, though OIG will look very suspiciously on that. Um, so not really. But um, I think that providers, again, have a significant amount of latitude as long as it's a legitimate uh, defense um, as to how you select a target patient population, which is one of the great al al um, aspects of the, the companion rules that, again, we just have a significant amount of flexibility, though I don't think that the flexibility is unlimited. And so as I, as I was referencing in the article, I'm looking to the advisory opinion and perhaps some other guidance from OIG to basically inform um, and put some meat on the bones of, of how we should be viewing these regulations, because it really can't be open-ended. I'm sure that that's not the intent. And, um, you know, whether we see it through advisory opinions, whether we see it through enforcement actions, I do think that there'll be some additional clarity as to what some of these terms mean. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the first things we teach young little health attorneys um, is that the Stark Law is strict liability. You violate the law, you are subject to penalties. 
versus the anti-kickback statute, which you have to have uh, intent uh, demonstrated uh, to have a violation. And, and this is, I, as you read through the safe harbor, which I believe has even more re specific requirements than the exception does on the Stark side. I mean, bottom line, if the parties have good intent, uh, which is to improve the quality of care, um, be more efficient in the delivery of care, will we'll, um, enforcement agencies really have a leg to stand on in trying to prove you couldn't meet the safe harbor? It's a great question. And it's one that's gone through my head as well, Marty. I think, um, you know, if we are in, we're talking a value-based enterprise, we have parties that are coming together, they are meeting regularly to discuss progress towards this outcome measure. And it's going to be a substantial, like it's going to be a substantive um, outcome measure, not something like patient satisfaction, patient convenience. We're talking about really concerted efforts among the different providers involved in that value-based enterprise to improve health outcomes of their target patient population. The question I have is whether that does mitigate um, any type of bad intent argument that the government may make. And um, I, I, I really think that if, if the parties are trying to come together, they're doing this hard work, they're doing good work, um, I, I just think it, it may make it harder for OIG to, um, to look at enforcement actions or DOJ for that matter from like a False Claims Act perspective. Um, so I, I think, again, it'll... I think time will tell as to what happens with um, with some of these partnerships that are encouraged by by the final rules. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I have not been able to get my head around, and I probably certainly not spent enough time thinking about this, but is um, in the physician employment relationship, um, where we're being asked more and more uh, to comment on compensation arrangements that include typical fee for service incentives, you know, work-based RVU compensation, but also now incorporate these elements of value-based care, whether that be, um, you know, achievement on uh, quality measures or engagement in certain activities. Um, do we still look at those through the lens of the employment exception? Does the value-based exception come into play uh, with regard to those arrangements? You know, how do we balance the two? Well, I think that the value, so certainly the employment exception is still available. Um, and I think that the, the new exceptions around value-based care give uh, a different pathway, right? So they, they give us a different option um, to, to uh, compensate physicians. Um, and so I think it's an additive approach and there's, there's even more flexibility. Um, and, and it's nice to, it's nice to have more options in how we, we compensate um, employed physicians. Well, as we wrap up here, um, what are your crystal ball predictions for the future, uh, both with regard to um, continued adoption of value-based arrangements, but also how um, the, the um, exception and the, way, and the safe harbor will play into that? Oh, if only I had a crystal ball. Um, I, I think that we will continue to see um, adoption of and, and the push towards value-based care. It has been slow. I certainly um, will acknowledge that. And I'm sure that the government um, acknowledges that um, even with the good efforts of the Innovation Center and um, to promote the Medicare Shared Savings Program, um, it has been a very slow process on the transition from uh, fee-for-service to value-based care. That being said, um, with the uh, solvency of the Medicare Trust Fund under continued assaults and with the uh, payers really moving towards uh, incenting uh, value-based care, I think that we will continue to be on this march towards value-based care. We'll continue to be living in this hybrid world where OIG and CMS are on the lookout for good things in terms of this transition to value-based care, but also um, continuing to express concerns about some of those legacy issues that the government has traditionally been worried about, such as overutilization, um, uh, unfair competition, patient steering, all of those types of things. 
So, um, and then one of the big hopes that I have is that the government issue guidance and advisory opinions interpreting some of the, um, the preamble commentary and some of the application of these final rules. So I hope that that's something that we see this year um, and, and perhaps into next year as well. It'll be a bumpy ride as it, as it has been, um, but that's what keeps it interesting, right? Absolutely. And we'll be back here next year to see <laughs> summarize what we saw in 2022 and what we'll see going forward. Um, Tiana, thank you so much for taking this time. I hope you have a good one. Thanks so much, Marty.